Hi everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to come in and watch this video called The Road Ahead. What we're going to do is we're going to go over a few things that we've done in the past and some of the things that we're going to be doing in the future. The first thing is we want to tell you where, where we are in terms of how we've organized our instruction at Thorpe. There is uh, Richard Elmore's The Instructional Core, which basically says that all, learn, all schools have three basic components. And the instruction that happens at that school has the student, the teacher, and the content. And they're all organized around the specific task that the students are supposed to be doing. So when we're thinking about that instructional core, we're always thinking about how we're working with our students and helping them progress, the instructional practices that the teachers are putting into place, and making sure that the content challenges the students uh, at their appropriate level. In order to do this, we've implemented a few things. As you know, when you go into a classroom, you're going to see a lot of small group instruction. And the reason that we do our small group instruction is that by teaching our students in small groups, our teachers are better able to gauge their understanding of the key concepts. The differentiation of instruction is also a little bit easier to implement as different groups may actually be grouped according to their abilities. So you'll always have, during those small groups instructions, you'll have different students working at different levels. And oftentimes you'll see the teacher working with a small group on her own. And typically what's going on with that small group, is, uh, it's either remediation or extension but the teacher's taking the time to actually work with those students. And oftentimes she's only working with, uh, depending on the number, anywhere between three to six students in that small group. We also are working on, on, on increasing our specialized endorsements throughout the building. Um, by ensuring that most of our students are dual endorsed in either general education or special education, uh, and English as a second language, we ensure that our students are taught in the general education classroom. What that means is the students are being challenged to the same extent as their general education peers. So the students who may be in special education or the students who might be in the bilingual program are being taught by teachers who have not only an endorsement in science or in language arts or in math, but many of our teachers also have their endorsements in special education or in ESL so that they can actually help uh, modify instruction and make sure that they're addressing the needs of those particular students. At Thorpe, we have over 20 special education endorsed teachers, and more than half of those teachers are actually teaching in the general education classroom. We also have about 17 ESL endorsed teachers, and all of those teachers are in the general education classroom. So what we've tried to do is instead of just pulling kids out for special ed education or pulling kids out for bilingual education, we try to incorporate the best practices in the actual classroom so that the kids are always being challenged um, and they're not seen as being part of a special group that may need more support, et cetera. Because what happens is when we have uh, the teachers in the classroom, they're helping the students individually. And that may mean some students may be in special education, but others may not. And sometimes you'll see these groups where you'll have a mix of different students and I think that's best practice because it allows the students to, um, to work together and get, get the help that they need. So in addition to the instructional core, you know that we've organized around the five C's. The five C's of communication, collaboration, critical thinking, um, creativity, and caring. One of the things that, we, that we've been recognized at Thorpe for is what we are a P21 school uh, that means that we're a national exemplar for schools that are incorporating those 21st century skills into the everyday instruction. And when you're looking at the, the well, they, they go with the four C's we've, we've added caring. Um, that's at the, that's at the, at the basis of what we're doing. But in addition to that, we are also making sure that our students are, are literate in different types of media. Uh, in terms of information technology, they also have uh, a literacy in, in, in basic technology uh, and communication. So you're going to see a lot of projects and um, different instruction that, that's organized around 
around technology and using it as a tool to help students communicate their understanding. We're also focusing on helping students become more productive and accountable as we focus on agency, uh, emphasizing leadership and responsibility, making sure that they're flexible and adaptable, that we're paying attention to social and cross-cultural skills, as well as the initiative for self-direction. Like how do we help our students become self-motivated and uh, know that they, that their purpose and their and that the agency that they have in the classroom actually can be reflected uh, in the outside world as well. Some of the other things that you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of environmental literacy, global awareness. We're working on financial literacy. We really haven't done too much with that, although we have done a little bit with uh, junior achievement um, and having our parents coming in and helping us with career day. Uh, and uh, but we'd like to we'd like to push that a little bit more. We're also working with our health literacy. Uh, Mr. Ryder is a full-time health teacher, but in addition to that, we've incorporated our, uh, the CPS sexual health curriculum uh, throughout kinder kindergarten through eighth grade. We have our counselor working with our teachers so that the students know the counselor uh, before there's a crisis or before there's a, a, a moment where they would typically visit her. So that way that there's a relationship already established. And our civic literacy is also part of what we try to do here at Thorpe as students understand, like for example, through student council, that their role in the school, they have a voice in the school in helping determine uh, where we're headed and um, also how, how to improve. Another area that I really want to focus on is our problem-based learning initiative. In our problem-based learning initiative, there's a number of things that we're trying to do. First, we're trying to make sure that the learning that happens in the classroom is meaningful and memorable for our students. Um, so we try to make sure that we're, we're organizing around problems that they can actually have an effect on. Uh, so what we've tried to do is we try to incorporate certain components into this problem-based learning. These components are things like uh, an interesting problem that kids can tackle at their at their own level, making sure that they can research, then that they can actually uh, critique each other in terms of in terms of that research, coming up with solutions that emphasizes their agency. Doesn't matter that they're eight years old; they can still have agency over the problems that that they're working on in their classroom. Having an authentic audience. So oftentimes you'll be asked to come in so that the students will be able to present the things that they're learning. It's really important because in education, oftentimes we forget that the, the purpose that we teach kids is so that they can go out and teach others or implement their learning um, outside of school. So that cycle is incredibly important. Um, and the, the last component of that is the reflection. So when we have a problem-based learning unit, the students reflect on how uh, they went through that process. Now, we're just starting off on this. This is our second, third year working with problem-based learning and, and different teams are getting better at it throughout the school. But it's one of those things that we, that we are committed to doing because uh, under the principles of universal design for learning, what this does is it allows all students to contribute at their particular level. So I'll give you an example. Um, back in eighth grade last year, Ms. McNally had a catapult uh, project that she came up with with the students. And the students were em employing algebraic concepts in the actual construction of that catapult. They were studying parabolas, et cetera, uh, how the quadratic equation sort of fit in there. Now, there were some students where the mathematics was way beyond them, but the actual building of the catapult was was a strength. So we saw some students who who uh, demonstrated their understanding of these key concepts through their mechanical thinking. Um, oftentimes, these students haven't been recognized. They haven't been able to demonstrate uh, or, or shine uh, in front of other students. By having these types of problem-based learning units, you have so many different components and so many different things that we can actually incorporate that students, for example, in our bilingual program or, or our, in our special education program, or just students who are typically not the ones who are, are highlighted uh, because they may be shy, et cetera, still have the opportunity to, to share their learning 
with their peers and the authentic audiences that, that we asked to come in. The next thing that we've been working on here at Thorpe is just outgrowing our labels. And uh, one of the things that we like to say is that labels are for jars, not for people. And many of the things that we're trying to do here address our diverse learners, our special education students, um, as well as labeling students as gifted or non-gifted or things like that, that we really want, want to address. First and foremost, we realize that all students are gifted in different capacities. Uh, some are gifted in math, some are gifted in reading, some are gifted in both. Some are gifted, in, as, as I said before, in uh, mechanical understanding. How we connect to those students and, and uh, help them uh, demonstrate their gifts in their understanding is at the core of what we're trying to do. So here's some of the things that we're, that we're doing with our teachers and students. Um, first, we know that how you perceive, perceive yourself matters. One of the things that we noticed uh, after my second year here, we started shifting how we were working with our um, with our student populations. Before, if a student was in a gifted program, they were there from kindergarten through eighth grade. They were there for all nine years. Uh, and there were a number of students that could be part of that program that weren't because of the, uh, the amount of space. So we made that a little bit more fluid. We introduced our accelerated program. We actually expanded our gifted so that way uh, from fifth through eighth grade, students may be paired in different classrooms for math and for reading, depending on their strength. And we also just differentiated the instruction into small groups. And this helped in a number of ways. Uh, first, it got rid of some of those labels that have been a uh, uh, w one of the issues that, that, that we've been tackling. Um, second, it also moved our progress. So for example, in the 2012-2013 school year, about uh, uh, we were in the, we were at, at the 66th percentile in in the country for our academic uh, achievement. Um, since that time, we we're typically in the top 10 percent uh, throughout throughout the year. So there was a substantial shift in just in just one year. The other thing that it allowed it allowed challenge levels to be extended to all students, um, so that it wasn't just a select few that were getting uh, lessons that were based on unit plans or interesting interesting assignments or participating in things like history fair or science fair, et cetera. We wanna make sure that everybody participates in those opportunities and, and those memorable moments um, that we have in our education. So that's, that's allowed a lot of that else to happen. It's also the reason that we're including our problem-based learning because it does include all of our students and it gives every student the opportunity to demonstrate their understanding in multiple capacities. So where are we going from here? Well, the first thing is we're looking at our curriculum throughout the building and we're making sure that our curriculum is challenging for all of our students and also aligned from kindergarten through eighth grade. Now that's difficult to do. So what we're trying to do is we're aligning our curriculum. We may not be able to do it from kindergarten through eighth grade at the outset, but we, we can do it from kindergarten through second. So our, kin our primary team is, has been organized in a grade band so they're looking at each other's instructional practices. The same for third and fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Further um, thing that we've done in seventh and eighth grade and in fifth and sixth, our teachers are teaching, uh, our math and reading teachers are teaching two grade levels, uh, fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth, uh, as well as our science and social studies teachers. Now, the reason why that's important is because it allows for the alignment of curriculum by design. So right from the beginning, teachers are collaborating with each other since they're working with both, with both uh, grade levels. Uh, we've also are working on refining our, and developing our PBL practices so that integrated units are the norm and not the exception. So you, going forward, you're going to see a lot more uh, problem-based learning units that have both a math component, science component, a social studies component, and a, uh, and a reading component. And that's one of the areas where, where we're making some dramatic shifts. We're also looking at our diverse learners and our English language learners. We've switched from a pullout model to an inclusion model uh, where the students are getting the supports that they need in their classrooms. 
Some of the other things that we're trying to do is we're changing the way we do our DL uh, instruction throughout the building. Uh, we call it our diverse learners hybrid for departmentalized grades. Because we have so many teachers who have received their endorsement in special education, what they're able to do is they're able to, pro to provide services both in the general education classroom as well as support for students in special education. Why this is important uh, is because it allows our teachers to co-teach um, and it allows our general education teachers to actually support students in other classrooms as special education teachers. So for example, in fourth grade, in fourth grade you have Ms. Stacker, uh, who teaches the students for reading and math in the gifted program. And then she provides support in special education for our students in Ms. Law's math class. Ms. Law provides uh, the math instruction for all of the, um, uh, for, for the fourth grade uh, in, in, the non, in, the, uh, in the classes that are not in uh, Ms. Stacker's classroom. Um, so she provides two math classes of instruction, and then she provides the general education, the special education support for the students in Ms. Haynes' reading class. Um, why is this important? Well, by doing this, it allows for all of the other grades to have just one inclusion teacher at every single grade level. So that special education teacher uh, from, from, from third grade all the way through eighth grade, uh, they're only assigned one grade level. That means that they plan with the teams. They work together with the teams. That's completely different than what you have at other Chicago public schools. So we've rolled out that diverse learners hybrid model to fourth grade, and we're also incorporating it into our eighth grade uh, this year, our seventh and eighth grade with Ms. Uh, Powers and Mr. Coughlin. And it's going to be one of the things that we roll out um, because it provides additional support for our students. One of the things that we noticed last year in our diverse learners growth, uh, diverse learners growth on NWA, uh, the fourth grade team where this model has been rolled out for the entire year, outperformed the rest of the school by a significant margin. Yeah. So we feel that this is going to, this is going to benefit our students. Uh, and it's just one of those innovative things that we do here at Thorpe. Um, the other thing is just changing the whole idea of special education. For many parents, special education has become stigmatized uh, because they feel, well, if my child's going to be in special education, uh, they're going to get extra help, but now they've been labeled um, as a special education student for, for, for their entire time at the school. We're changing that because we're looking at special education as something that students can go in and out of depending on the support that's needed. Uh, the instructional practices aren't going to be very different because you have co-taught classes from uh, third grade all the way up through eighth grade uh, because of the model that we've implemented. Uh, since there's only one teacher, or there's actually two teachers in for reading and for math, that special education teacher is often the lead teacher in the classroom. The goal being that students shouldn't know who's a special education teacher and who's a general education teacher because they both provide supports and instruction for all students. The other thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, expand this model into our ESL and our bilingual program as well by having our dual endorsed teachers. We're allowing them uh, to, to provide extra support for students without having to remove them out of the classroom. Uh, the final thing that we're looking for in the next few years is to provide special education for our top 1% of students. Uh, the students that are typically in the, in the 99th percentile uh, relate a little differently to other students. Uh, and sometimes they have many, uh, many uh, communication issues that we've seen with other students in special education. But more importantly, they need to be challenged on a completely different level than where, where most of the students are. So, so a student testing at the 85th percentile is very different than a student testing in that top one percentile. So we need to modify our instruction uh, for that. Special education, uh, it, as the way that it's practiced in Chicago, is often just limited to the students at, at, who need remediation and help. What we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we provide that extra support for the students who need 
um, extensive modification so that they are challenged and their, their uh, learning is extended. And that's one of the things that we're looking at right now. And one of the things that our diverse learners hybrid program uh, will allow in the future. A big push that we have throughout the building is on leadership. Uh, and that means both uh, creating leaders among our students, and letting them know that they have agency, that they can actually change things in their environment. So we are pushing uh, students to participate in things like student council, sports, et cetera. Uh, as a faculty, we've read the book, The Leader in Me, and it's a, it's, a, um, it's a book around the seven habits of highly effective people that's written for schools. Uh, we spent all, all of last year looking at that and implementing some of those practices in our classroom. This year, we're also looking at the art of coaching teams and some of the practices that we're learning as a faculty, uh, we're actually doing this with our team leads throughout the building. We're implementing some of those things in our classrooms as well, things like norms for students to understand how to work together because sometimes you just need a little bit of help because not everybody's gonna get along on a team, but we are responsible to produce and to get the work done. Um, and this is one of the things that we're working on together. So with regards to our students, our problem-based learning is focused all around agency. What can students do to make a difference, a positive difference, in, in their world, and their world right now is Thorpe School. Where we're headed in the next three years, we're gonna really be focusing on those seven, seven habits of highly effective uh, people for students. Um, you're gonna see some of that during their win periods. You're gonna see an expanded leadership role for our, for our students and student council. They will be part as honorary members of our, our, of our LSC. We're also gonna provide models of leadership and collaboration and group work with our being mirrored by our teachers. So as teachers work together in groups, the practices that they're modeling in their own teams will be modeled by our students. So assigning roles, uh, respecting norms, uh, making sure that, that we have timelines and uh, accountability uh, checklists. All of these things are things that you're gonna be seeing in your students' uh, classrooms as well. And then finally, we really have to look at our five essentials and we have to ask ourselves, why are our students uh, saying that they need a more supportive environment? So all of these issues are addressing that whole supportive environment issue that we've seen on five essentials. And this year we're really helping our students understand um, their role in the school and their voice in the school. And we hope to see, we hope to see an improvement, a market improvement in our supportive environment for our students. Things like student of the month, things like celebrating uh, their achievements, uh, making sure that they're participating in our problem-based learning projects. All of these things are things that I think will, uh, will bear fruit as students realize that their learning matters. For teachers and staff, our teachers have various uh, roles throughout the building of, of leadership. Um, many of them are getting their administrative certificate, so we know that there's going to be quite a number of principals coming out of this school. We have, I think we have about five teachers who already have their principal endorsement, and uh, about three of them are seeking, uh, actively seeking administrative positions. Um, and we're looking forward to expanding what we're doing here at Thorpe so that it changes the whole system. One of the reasons I became a principal was to, uh, was to support other schools so that our best practices are being mirrored at other places. So we've seen um, Dr. Chapin become the principal over at Pressing. We've had Dr. Chambers uh, take a lead role in the Evanston uh, Special Education Department uh, at the district level. Um, we'll be seeing uh, Mr. Roberts uh, move on to the principalship uh, soon as well. So developing school leaders is at the core of what we're doing here at Thorpe both leaders here in school and also leaders that will tra help transform Chicago and other places as well. In terms of our instructional practice, we've done a number of things here at Thorpe that are a little different. First, uh, we get together at least one th once a month to just talk about student work and we share student work at the grade level uh, 
uh, grade band uh, teams so that teachers share uh, their assignments and how students have performed uh, so that they can analyze what's going on in every single classroom at their, uh, at their grade bands. So seventh and eighth grade will get together and they'll all look at a math assignment. Uh, what's nice about that is that, the, that, that we can actually talk about how we can incorporate all subjects in our assessments. The other thing that we're doing is we're looking at each other's practices in the classroom. So all of the Thorpe teachers have visited so far at the end of the first quarter, most of the teachers have, have visited at least um, eight or nine classrooms where they've seen their colleagues and how they're teaching uh, throughout the building. We hope to expand that uh, as, as we continue because what we're trying to develop is a community of learners we, where we learn from each other, we reflect on what needs to improve, and then we implement those improvements. Finally, where are we headed in the next five years? Uh, these are my own personal goals for the school, but they've been informed by not only our parents, but also our teachers, as well as our, as well as our students. First, we wanna be the number one Scholastic Academy for combined growth and attainment. Uh, in the system, in CPS, there's about six Scholastic Academies. Uh, right now, we have a couple that are that are ahead of us. Uh, that's uh, Hawthorne uh, Scholastic Academy and Stone Scholastic Academy. We're right, we're we're very close with with Stone in terms of performance, in terms of growth and attainment. Uh, but we have a little bit of work in order to catch up to uh, uh, catch up to Hawthorne. Uh, so that's one of the things that we will be working on. Second, we're also integrating that problem-based learning approach to our curriculum design throughout the building. We want to see problem-based learning at the core of what we do uh, more often than not. Right now, we're looking at our problem-based units as, uh, as a, 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 just a, a few throughout the year that are, that are a big deal. What we want to do is we want to bring in that problem-based learning perspective to multiple units throughout the year. Um, and as we get better at this, uh, this is something that we'll be doing. In addition to having students have an authentic audience, uh, making sure that they're working on, on real problems that they can address, uh, making sure that they have their own research, making sure that they have their own voice, we also wanna make sure that we're integrating the different subjects so that students realize that what I'm learning in math may actually influence some of the things that I'm learning in science as well, and vice versa. We want to make sure that we have financial stability throughout the building. Uh, in our discretionary funds, my goal is to have uh, $1 million as a backup for, our, um, for any projects or things that we may, we may have. Now, where, does, where do these come from? These come from cell phone tower money, from things like our, uh, our aftercare program, et cetera. Um, and what that will allow for us is as CPS, as you all know, goes up and down, there's a lot of uncertainty that's attached to that. And we have to plan ahead and realize how can we prepare ourselves for that next crisis that, that's just around the corner. And, and typically in CPS, that's the way you're, you're always feeling. So by making sure that we have adequate uh, backup funds, um, it'll ensure that, that we're ready for, for those unexpected moments that, that happen so unfortunately, expectedly. Uh, we're also looking at ADA improvements, including a lot, an elevator, as well as classrooms designed specifically for our students with severe disabilities. Uh, as a magnet school, we're never going to get an addition because we have controlled enrollment. But one of the things that we do know is that our students, specifically in our cluster program, uh, need classrooms that are designed for them. And we're addressing that by appealing to CPS to say, we want to be the, um, the foremost example on how to do this instruction throughout the building. If we do get that, we hope to, see an, we hope to have an elevator, uh, three new classrooms, um, which will then allow us to also have a preschool program. Uh, and that's something that, we, that, that many of our parents have been asking for. And I think it's something that, that we uh, can commit ourselves to once we get the extra space. Um, and finally, 100% uh, dual indoors faculty. That means general education, ESL, LBS1, bilingual, et cetera. Those are things that we're, that we're looking for. I really wanna uh, thank you for taking the time to pay attention to this presentation.